The peace of Christ be with you. Confession on page 12 in the front of the hymnal. As is often the tradition in the United Methodist churches, it's the first Sunday of the month and we celebrate Holy Communion. And so we recite prayerfully the confession which is a part of that communion liturgy. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our individual sin in silence. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us join in the prayer for illumination. Most Holy Trinity, open us in mind, body, and spirit so that we may fully hear and heed your living word. Amen. Psalm 125 
was written for people to sing as they go to worship, as they go up the hill we call Mount Zion. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion that cannot be moved, enduring forever. Jerusalem hills enfolded, and the Lord enfolds his people now and forever. The scepter of the wicked shall never rest upon the land allotted to the righteous, that the righteous not set their hand to wrongdoing. Do good, O Lord, to the good, to the upright in heart. But those who in their crookedness act corruptly, let the Lord make them go the way of evildoers. May it be well with Israel. And then from wisdom literature, from Proverbs, a collection of works that go together and sometimes, if you read them in succession, seem to contradict each other. In one place it says, uh, not to answer a fool, and another it says give a good answer to a fool, for example. Well, all I know is fools sometimes need to be answered and sometimes need to be ignored. But the Proverbs are credited to Solomon, who you remember as king, asked in humility from God that God grant him wisdom so that he could rule justly. So we as Christians turn to Proverbs for advice on how to live wisely and righteously. Hear then from Proverbs 22. Repute is preferable to great wealth. Grace is better than silver and gold. Rich man and poor man meet. The Lord made them both. The one who sows injustice shall reap misfortune. His rod of wrath shall fail. The generous man is blessed. For he gives of his bread to the poor. Do not rob the wretched because they are wretched. Do not crush the poor in the gate. For the Lord will take up their cause and despoil those who despoil them of life. And then because we also need to hear from the New Testament, though it isn't indicated on your bulletin, my mistake, I want to read to you from a brand new translation called the First Nations Version, an indigenous translation of the New Testament. And I give kudos to our colleague, Dan Reed, who is pastor down at Greer's Chapel in Magnolia, who is himself a member of an indigenous tribe and married to Corey Tyson Reed, who is the director of the Wesley Foundation at Southern Arkansas University. Dan po pointed out the existence of this translation. Before it was complete in the New Testament, you could get gos the Gospels, the four Gospels, and Ephesians. And so, of course, I got that as soon as I could and then put on pre-order this copy. It has a lovely cover. And I want us to hear then the words of James chapter 2 from our sisters and brothers of the indigenous tribes. <clears throat> My sacred family members, as you trust in our bright and shining honored chief, creator sets free, Jesus, the chosen one, do not treat one person better than another. Let us say someone comes into your sacred gathering wearing fine clothes and costly jewelry and some poor person comes in dressed in rags. Then you give more honor to the one wearing fine clothes, saying, come, sit here in this honored place. But you say to the one dressed in rags, go stand over there, or sit here on the floor where people lay their feet. If you treat people in this way, have you not decided that some among you are better than others and acted like crooked council members with bad hearts? Hear me, my much loved sacred family members, did not the Great Spirit choose the ones the world looks down on as poor to be rich in trusting and sharers together in the good road that the Creator has promised to those who love Him? Why would you show no respect for the poor? 
Isn't it the rich who drag you down and bring you before their own corrupt counsels? Aren't they the ones who speak evil against the honorable name spoken over you? If you love your fellow human beings in the same way you love yourselves, as it says in our sacred teachings, you are doing well, for you are walking in the true meaning and purpose of the law of our honored chief. But if you treat one person better than another, you are walking in broken ways and guilty of not following our sacred teachings. For whoever does everything our tribal law requires, yet fails in one thing, is guilty of breaking all of it. The one who told us to be faithful in marriage also told us not to take the life of another. If you are faithful in marriage but take away the life of another, you have become one who fails to keep the law. In all that you say or do, remember that it is the chosen one's law of freedom that the Creator will use to decide for or against you. When the Great Spirit decides, no mercy will be shown to those who have not shown mercy. On the other hand, the ones who have shown mercy will have mercy shown to them. So then, mercy wins the victory over judgment. What good is it, my sacred family members, if a person says, I have faith, but has no deeds to show for it? Can that kind of faith set them free and make them whole? If a family member or any human being has no clothes to wear, no food to eat, and you say, go in peace, stay warm, and eat well, but fail to give what is needed, what good have you done? In the same way, without deeds, faith by itself is dead. Let me read that again. In the same way, without deeds, faith by itself is dead. All these are the words of God for the whole world. Thanks be to God. Well, children, I think that everybody who is here today knows a thing <clears throat> that requires you to take your hands and put them together and put your fingers inside like this. Right? And then you put your two pointer fingers up touching each other and put your thumbs touching each other. This is hard when we have our thumbs. <laughs> and it's not easy. Okay, everybody got it? Right? Okay, Miss Liz is talking down here. Now, what goes with this? Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. And this morning, I know the new verse. It says, the point of figure says, See her going up the stairs to say her prayer? Isn't that interesting? Well, so the church has people inside. Here we are. We're inside the church and we're the people. But here's the thing. Margaret goes to work at the University of Arkansas Medical Science Building. There are a whole bunch of them, but I found her today. She couldn't hide And when she goes to work, one floor down is top, her husband, who is a nurse. Isn't that right? And they take care of people, right? And back there is Miss Perry. And Perry, she is an attorney. You know what an attorney is? It's a lawyer. Lawyers do things to keep people safe. And let me see, who else do I have out there? None of the rest of these ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no. Hey, lots of people here are retired. Oh, I see. There's, see that guy back there in the back? See that? He owns a place that makes pictures beautiful. Isn't that right? Be a friend. I have pictures on my wall that I love because they were framed in such a wonderful way. Now, all those people, when they are in those places, they also are the church. Now, there's no steeple 
over there at UANS, or at your law office, or at your house, or at your, your building next to Sissy's log cabin. Always have to be a for Sissy because she's a big girl in that. There's not a steeple, but all those places are church because there are the people. And you know what? Over at your house, when you and your mother are there, that's church. Did you know that? It is. It's a wonderful thing. So church is wherever the people who love Jesus are. Let's thank Jesus for that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us church. For giving us church. Help us to love. Help us to love. And to always name your name. And to always name your name. In your name, Jesus, we pray. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. sing together when the church of Jesus found on 592 your fingers correctly in position, what you get when you open up the church is emptiness. During the pandemic, we've had to imagine that sort of reality, that the buildings have been emptied. But the church has always been at work. The buildings are on the corners everywhere. Wherever you go in Arkansas and most of the rest of the nation of the United States, you will find a United Methodist Church in every county. One of the presidents commented one time that there may not be a post office everywhere, but those Methodists are everywhere. And we were in all places because we figured out early on that you need to go where people are. And so we put the circuit riders on horseback and we sent them out. We sent them out to wear them out. Most of them served, and when they retired, they died. 
kind of like today, I guess, but we, we honor them because they would ride there by horseback and they would go the distance that was good for a, a, a horseback rider and then they would look for a likely cabin and they would check the people there and then they would invite themselves in and they would plant a church. So the distance from one cabin to another became the distance from one church to another. So here in Little Rock, for example, you can go not too far away and you'll find our sisters and brothers of Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church over there. And you can go that other way down Mississippi and find our friends at Trinity United Methodist. And you, if you don't turn soon enough, you'll, you'll, you'll go on out west and you'll find Geyer Springs and Western Hills. And, but if you turn on Markham, you'll find Faith and, and then if you keep on going, you'll find, uh, what's that other little church out there? Oh yeah, St. James. And if you keep on going out Cantrell, you'll find a brand new church, Pinnacle View, which isn't a new church at all. It's just a renamed church so that you can tell where it is. Pinnacle View there on the corner near the Popeyes and the Baskin Robbins. I mean, what an appointment. The buildings are everywhere, but Christ is in our hearts. And so wherever we are, when Jesus is with us, we can be like Jesus, loving as Jesus does, reaching out with our hearts and hands to help others, and therefore we are the church. But in wisdom, we have to ask, how can we be the church when we are within the building and outside it? And so we turn to things like Proverbs, and it Proverbs has these interesting little sayings. If you do wrong, you're going to eventually get caught. Eventually, you'll be punished. Um, it, the, the Proverbs point out to us that um, material stuff isn't as important as a good reputation. When people care and know the truth about you, and the truth about you is a good thing, that's better than being rich and famous. Proverbs tells us that Generous people give generously, not only to feed the poor, but to care about why the poor are hungry. Therefore, the wisdom literature tells us that we should be just in dealing with others, especially we should be careful in how we treat those who are wretched. Wretched. Mitch Hay, who is now pastor at Ar uh, Harvard Epworth, United Methodist Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, along with his wife, Barbara Limmel. He and I were walking the first semester we were there in, in Boston. We, we were just taking a stroll, seeing how things were downtown in Boston. And we walked along and I saw one of those people, those wretched people. <clears throat> and I was practicing that good Southern trait of not seeing what was right in front of me because it was so sad to see. And Mitch, who is from Illinois and doesn't know any better, reached into his pocket and began to draw out some money and walked right over to this wretched person and spoke to him. And I kind of stepped back and I thought, what are you doing? Because I knew that Mitch was, Mitch was sort of living on the edge himself. Going to seminary is expensive and he hadn't gotten a scholarship like I had and he didn't have a job like I had. And, he was young and foolish and really Christian. And he, he spoke to the man who was there. And I'll be darned if he didn't shake his hand. And he said, how are you doing? And the man looked up with the kind of gratitude that comes from being seen. And Mitch said, I'm sorry I don't have a lot, but..." Here's what I have. And he gave him a dollar. And we walked off and I said, what in the world were you doing? What were you thinking? You don't have a dollar to spare. He said, of course I have a dollar to spare. I had a dollar, didn't I? I said, why did you do that? He said, well, Pam, we said we were going to follow Jesus, didn't we? I said, well, yes. He said, and we're here at Boston University School of Theology preparing to become ministers of the gospel, aren't we? And I thought, oh, he is going to get me but good. And he did. 
Because he said that if you don't pay attention to the people and you simply describe them as wretched, then you haven't seen them as Jesus sees them. Je Jesus doesn't see us in the condition that the world sees us. Jesus doesn't care what kind of car you drive. Personally, Pope Francis and I think that more of you should drive Ford Focuses because that's what he and I drive. However, they're not making them anymore, so maybe it's moot. But God doesn't care. God says if you're wealthy enough to own an expensive car, God bless you. But be sure, God tells us in the wisdom literature, that you treat everyone with the same kind of respect with the kind of justice that God is showing you in the mercy that God is showing you. It's all over on the clergy pages today for um, this Sunday. It says everywhere in United Methodism today, Methodists are preaching this most Methodist text of James. Faith without works is dead. Our friend Luther wasn't real keen on that. He wanted everybody to understand that it was only by faith that we are saved. And we believe that, we who follow in the Wesleyan tradition, the great tradition of the church itself all the way back. What we understand is it's not enough to say yes to Jesus and stop. We understand that once we say, once we say yes to Jesus in our heart of hearts, in our minds, and with our bodies, we then want we are compelled to show that we are following Jesus in love by doing deeds that demonstrate the depth and breadth of God's love for us and for all. And so the outpouring of our dedication in our faith is that we give what we can when we can. It's only been a month, I guess, since the hurricane hit Haiti, and one of you sent me an email saying, now we will take up a special offering for that, won't we? And I confess I hadn't really thought about it, but yes, surely we will. We'll take up an encore advance for that, and then the fires, and then Hurricane Ida in Louisiana, and then Hurricane Ida going all the way up. Our friends in Waverly, Tennessee are having church today in the Methodist Church in spite of the floods there. And then the floods in Pennsylvania and New York and elsewhere and even the people on the news, even those people on the news that I always think somehow are above everything were talking this morning about how they had to borrow wet vacs to clean out their basements and how they were going to have to throw things away and how it didn't really matter because material stuff was not so important when you realized that you were safe. So here we are asking the question of what does it mean to be the church of Jesus? It does mean that we are who we are here at 2223 Durwood. It means that we're a witness as we are here in this building and in our fellowship hall and in the building that Ozark Mission Project occupies and in what we call the annex where the scouts are doing what scouts do of helping young people become better people. I came out of my office this week sort of surprised because there was somebody standing there. <clears throat> and I wasn't expecting anybody to be here because we keep the doors locked when we're alone in the building and I hadn't heard anybody come in except the custodians and I knew where they were because I could hear their vacuum. And I looked and, oh, it was a handsome fellow. Boy Scout, all dressed up with his sash on and all of these badges and he had his mask on and he had a name tag but I couldn't couldn't read it and I said well hello how are you and what are you doing here <laughs> and he said well you know we have we have scouts in the building over there and I said yes I know that <laughs> and he said and I'm I'm here they're in there talking about me for for my Eagle Scout review. And I asked him what his project was, and it was a trail out at Lake Nixon, and I said, that's great. I said, I look forward to your court of honor. You see, if you want to be an Eagle Scout, you can't just show up. You have to do something. 
And once you say that you're an Eagle Scout, I don't know, are there Eagle Scouts here this morning? Uh-huh. There he is, see? And what did he do this morning? Steve Martin showed up, and he and Jane filled up the cups so we could have communion. Eagle Scouts don't just say something with their fingers together and proudly wear the pins and the badges and the sashes and all that. They do things. They do honorable things like Gerald Ford, who when he became president knew that the right thing to do was to move our country on and he pardoned a president so we could move on. As Christians, we say yes to Jesus. As members of the church, the body of Christ, we say we want to be real in what we are doing. And so we grab all the wisdom we can to help us know how to be loving people of all people. We do this because we have confidence and hope that when we strive to do what we can do, alone and together, we are being faithful. And we believe, we believe sometimes despite what we see around us, that all shall be well. For God has said, I will be with you to the end of the age. And in the meantime, love one another as I love you. Rest in that love. Exult in that love. Enjoy that love until all is as God intends. Amen. So, as we prepare to move towards the communion table, I invite us to commit ourselves again to following God as the church, singing out of the faith we sing, together we serve. Affirmation of faith comes from the writings of Paul, who asks the question that we can answer. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loves us. We are sure that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Give us 
loving God, we give you thanks for what you give us in such abundance. Help us then, having received this, to know that you are with us, that you guide us and sustain us. And we will give you all praise and glory in how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to pray now for the world. And we've been specifically asked today to pray for the members of the Arkansas Conference who have gone on our behalf to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to assess the damage from Hurricane Ida. Let me say a word about how we do things in the Methodist Church. You may see in the news media reports of other denominations or individual churches who have gotten their things together and they're running off to help and that's good and we bless them. But we United Methodists, we have a method. You know, we have these things, procedures and processes. We're in it for the long haul. Our colleague Ellen Alston was down in South Louisiana when Katrina hit. Her parsonage was flooded, completely destroyed. She lost everything. But when you're a pastor and you're in the midst of a storm, you do what you have to do. And so she went to work. She did such a good job that the next time we came around, it was time for us to elect people to be bishop. We all said, you know, you, you, you ought to be a bishop. You handled that well. And she said, oh, no, I don't want to be a bishop. <laughs> what she learned and what we learned is that it takes more than just a couple of weeks of help. It takes a long time to do what needs to be done. And sometimes it seems like we never get it over. The recovery isn't finished, and then there's another one. That's sort of what's happened post-Katrina and now in post-Ida. But the United Methodist Committee on Relief is organized so that in every district of every conference of the United Methodist Church, there's a person or persons who are designated as disaster response coordinators. And that means that they figure out in consultation with others what needs to be done so that district by district we can respond in the ways that we can in our unique qualifications, district by district, for as long as it takes. I will print these names in the newsletter, this next issue that comes out, but for now, I want you to join me in praying for Sherry Matthews of the Southwest District, Brian Mann of the Northwest District, our own Andrew Smith of the Northwest District, that's uh, Martin's uh, son-in-law, Pastor Ken Savills, Northwest District, Paul Grandy Jr., Northwest District, Kevin Overholt, Northwest District, Aletha and Eric Fox of the Northeast District, Ida and Lester Rose of the Central District, Shelley and Roy Lee of the Central District, Donna and David Johnson of the Central District, and Caleb Hennington from the Central District. Caleb is our communi digital communications person in the conference office. And so we want to be sure that we pray for them as they do their work along with all those others around the country who are doing that similar thing. Are there other joys that you would share? Because I think it's a great joy to know that we are a part of a system that can help in this way. And I do encourage you to make your extra gifts to uh, UMCOR, either to, what, to whatever tragedy <laughs> Boats your boat. If you like fires or floods or hurricanes. <clears throat> Joyce? Concerns. Well, I, well I'm going to say, Margaret told me, you all remember little, what was his name, Gus? Ian Goza. Ian Goza was a scout. Now he's a grown-up. But his sister is an intern who started this week. Social work intern. That's, that's worth praising God for. Praise God for that. Yes, Judy? Uh, 
Santiago, we prayed for. He was in a, an ATV accident, and he is out of the hospital. He still needs our prayers, but he's smiling, and his mama's smiling, and we continue to pray and give thanks for Children's Hospital in the great work that they do. Other joys? Other concerns? Let's pray for our young people here in Little Rock, especially those in the high schools. There seems to be um, some tension about coming back to school. And so let's pray for them to be wise in their conflicts and for us to, to pray for them to be safe. It's, it's difficult to get back into the routine, and being a teenager is just... Well, I'll tell you what, when I was in seminary, we had a class where we talked about how you assess people's well-being. And one of the professors pointed out to us that if you gave the traditional tests for examining whether somebody was suffering from some sort of mental illness breakdown, um, there were clear markers. Then the professor said, now, the thing I do want to caution you about, though, is that if you, if you were to give these tests to teenagers, they would all register as being insane. It's just the nature of the teenage angst. So let's pray for them, their teachers, and also, of course, um, for their families. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, it is so good to know that we can turn to you with the needs of our hearts and with the joys of our hearts. And so this day, we give you thanks that we have been able to be together by technology and in person, that we are in all things conquerors through the power of your love in us, and that you give us the power and strength to be who we are meant to be in the world. We give you thanks, God, that you bring us peace in the midst of turmoil. And on this weekend when so many are enjoying a day off, we remember those who work for justice for those who labor in the world, especially those who work below minimum wage, the people who pick our fruits and vegetables. We pray for those who drive trucks and work in rail yards, for those who stock the stores, for those who check us out, running the scanners over produce that is so abundant. We praise you, God, for those whose labor gives us freedom. And so we pray for those in law enforcement and the medical professions, for teachers, for all who work in so many ways. And we ask, God, that you will give us all a view of the meaning of work whatever that work is. And we thank you for the work you give us. We who have been commissioned by you to go forth in your name to serve the world so that all may know your grace, so that all may live in peace. And so we pray in your holy name, in the name of the one who redeems us, who saves us, and who compels us to love, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now as you are able, will you stand so that we can sing our hymn of praise and going forth, forth in thy name, O Lord, number 438. <laughs>
the physical activity. No, 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 you're right. I'm sorry, but this is what not located. Test, test, test.
I don't hear anything in the farm office from people. Well, do they even hear themselves? Well, in this matter, I don't hear the car monitors. Is that so they can hear what's from here? Yes, yeah, so, so 